This is Rust in Production, a podcast about companies who use Rust to shape the future of infrastructure. My name is Matthias Endler from Corolla, and today we're talking to Paul Dix from Influx Data about how they use Rust in the latest version of InfluxDB. And without any further ado, Paul, can you introduce yourself and the company InfluxDB? Yeah. So I'm Paul Dix. I'm the co-founder and CTO of Influx Data, which is the company that makes InfluxDB. So InfluxDB is an open source time series database. So developers can use it for tracking what's going on in their servers, their applications. Sensor data is a very big use case for us. Uh, we created the project in 2013 and had the 1.0 release in 2016, the 2.0 release in I think 2020, and we have now 3.0 available, not in open source yet, only under our commercial offerings as a cloud offering or as an on-premise software. And we'll have a 3.0 open source release, hopefully an alpha by the end of this year or early next year. Awesome. So take us back to 2013. What was the ecosystem of time series databases back then? What was your personal need to start the project? And also how, how did InfluxDB and Influx Data start in general? Yeah, so obviously the world of time series databases was very different in 2013. So I started the company with uh, my co-founder actually in 2012, and we started originally as a totally different thing, right? It was an application called Airplane, like E-R-R-P-L-A-N-E, -E, and we were building like a SaaS application for doing real-time metrics and monitoring and a application exceptions. So, you know, like in the same vein as like Datadog or New Relic or any one of these dozens of other companies. And to build that application, like originally my goal there was I have a bit of a background in machine learning. And my thought was I can apply machine learning techniques to all this monitoring data and do things like predictive analytics and anomaly detection and stuff like that. But first we had to build like the application to get people to actually send us our data, their data. And essentially I had to build like a time series API, you know, for storing all of this data and working with it at scale. And the first thing I built was essentially web services written in Scala using Cassandra as the backend database and Redis is basically like a real-time indexing layer and like last value store. So I created that. We got into Y Combinator in the winter 13 batch. And around this time, I actually rewrote that backend in Go using LevelDB, which is a storage engine that was open sourced originally at Google. And I built like this basically all in one thing. And that thing became the backend for this SaaS application. We went through the program. I raised the seed round of funding. I was the founding CEO of the company. And then by the fall of 2013, we realized that that company just wasn't going to work. Like we had maybe a dozen or so customers. They weren't even paying us enough to like pay our infrastructure bills. Thankfully, at that time, we were still using free Amazon credits. <laughs> And we realized that that wasn't going to take off, but we thought there was something there with the infrastructure that we had built, right? We could see a bunch of other companies kind of trying to roll their own, like create this from scratch, right? Every other server monitoring company, every user analytics company, every, every analytics company of any kind was kind of creating their own time series database, either from scratch or with a bunch of application code on top of a more general purpose database. And what I saw in large companies is that they were trying to solve this problem with open source tools. And at the time, the only thing available in 2013 was essentially Graphite. So Graphite or RRD. And Graphite in 2013, it's a, you know an open source project written in Python. It's a metrics data store. It was originally built in 2008 by a team at Orbitz. And it hadn't had an actual release in over a year. Like basically it was a project that was largely orphaned, but it had a surprising amount of adoption in large companies that were trying to build their own monitoring stack using open source tools. And the other thing I saw was I, I, I had actually had prior to this in 2010, I was working for a fintech startup. And for that fintech startup, I had to build a solution for working with time series data. This was like financial market data, 
and stuff like that. And the set of tools that I used was the same set of tools I used to build the first backend for Airplane. So I could see this like idea of time series, not just being about server monitoring data, but financial market data, user analytics data, real-time analytics data, and sensor data, which in 2013 wasn't really a big thing, but it was starting to become like obvious that it probably would be. So essentially what we did was we said, okay, well, the application airplane isn't taking off. So let's maybe do a quick spike real quick. We'll take the the same tools that we had built the back end of airplane with, take some of that code and pull it out and repurpose it as an open source project. And we built that and we basically like took, I think like five or six weeks to build a prototype of this thing. And then in early 2013, in November of 2013, I arranged to give some talks at some meetups and I announced that we were working on it. We had like a basic documentation website that landed on the front page of Hacker News. And it was, you know, there all day. And a bunch of people said like they were interested in it. And when I gave these talks, it was obvious pretty quickly that people were really interested in what we were building. It looked like we were trying to address a need that a lot of people had that nobody else was kind of paying attention to at that time. Mm -hmm. If you say that was around 2013, that was still pretty early for Go. So I wonder if it was one of the first major projects for Go outside of Google even. So yeah, Go 1.0 came out in I think March of 2012, which is when like basically in the fall of 2012 is when I started using it pretty heavily. Docker was written in Go and that came out in early 2013. And then right around the same time in you know 2013, 2014, HashiCorp started creating their first set of tools in Go. So there was like this whole like set of projects around that time that started, you know, started in Go. But we definitely early on in, you know, late 2013, all of 2014 and 2015, we uh, definitely got a lot of interest from developers because of the fact that we were written in Go. Yeah, I can guess that would be the case. And maybe you also worked a little bit with that hype and, and also generated some traction for your product early on because Go had a focus on maybe web scale or maybe even infrastructure products. And it, that is still the case, of course. So that was sort of the most sensible tooling for this job, right? Yeah, I mean, at, at the time when we started the project, the debate we had internally was, do we write do we write the database in C, C++, or Go? And the reason we you know, were hesitant at first to write it in Go was because of the garbage collector, right? A database is, you know, usually a very performance sensitive piece of system software. Generally, you want to have total control over what happens. But the thing is, there were other databases that were written in Java, which obviously has garbage collector. So I thought, well, we could just use the same techniques that those databases use if we end up running into problems with Go's garbage collector, right? Their techniques are basically hide hide the hide the memory away from the garbage collector and manage it yourself in some place right in some unsafe place and our our bet at that time was you know we we knew go more than we knew either c or c++ and we just thought you know it was me my co-founder and one other person and we just thought you know our biggest problem right now is trying to make software that anybody will want to use so we figured we could do more faster with Go and that the language, you know, in 2013, our bet was the language will just keep improving and we'll get the benefits of those improvements along the way. And that certainly ended up being the case over the, you know, over the next 10 years. I mean, most, I would say, you know, 3.0 is written in Rust. So we could talk, obviously we'll get to that. But most of what we run right now for our customers and in production is Go code, right? Like, we have we have yet to transition a lot of the business over to the Rust code base that we now have. Yeah. I got in touch with InfluxDB around 1.0. It was even before that, was somewhere around 0.8. That was the first Fusion we, uh, version we used in production at Trivago. And 
InfluxDB was killing it. And it was so performant in comparison to what we had before, which was, of course, graphite and something custom. And then all of a sudden you had access to something that scaled to all of our servers. We run, we ran this thing for about a year on a single machine and it handled the entire traffic of Trivago. Only later we went with Influx Cluster and, and so on. But the the point that I'm trying to make is what you built was purely magical, I would even say, because something like that didn't exist before. And you bargained from storage engines like LevelDB or I guess later you switched to BoltDB as well. Maybe you can talk a little bit about this and say, why did you move away from LevelDB and why did you look for alternatives in the end? And just in general, what were some of the main problems that you faced building something like this in Go or any other language for that matter? Yeah, so LevelDB is essentially a key value store where the key space is ordered, right? So you can do range scans on the key value on the key space and get the values. It's written in C++, which if you're bringing that into a Go program, you know, you pay a price for 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 making for for the C Go bridge. So what the way so one of the common things in a time series use case is people want to people like data is super valuable like around the time when it's ingested and generated and the value of the data quickly falls off a cliff right particularly in like monitoring and stuff like that a lot of times like people don't need the raw high precision data longer than say 10 days right so one of the and the thing is the volume of data that you're ingesting the number of individual records that you're ingesting is way way higher than you see in you know traditional like transactional database workloads right if you have a customer database you're not you don't generally have like a billion records a day that you're ingesting right so one of the problems in in the time series space is figuring out how to manage the life cycle of that data and a lot of times how to basically just evict that data from the database as it ages out right so people wanted to say i want to keep my data around for seven days or i want to keep my data around for 90 days and I want it to automatically go away when that's done. Now, in a traditional database, if you did this the naive way, which would be you issue a delete for every record 90 days after you know you insert it, your database would just completely fall over, right? The, it's not designed to delete it, it, literally every single record that you feed into the database. It just causes the performance to completely fall off a cliff, right? So generally... If you're using a traditional like transactional database, the way you organize the data is you say, I'm going to make create a table, an actual table for each day of data. And then when the day ages out, I will drop the table. Dropping a table is cheap because you're literally just like, you know, getting rid of the files. So in level DB, essentially what we would have to do is for each period of time. And for us, I think at that time, we had a period of time be seven days. We would create a new level DB database. Now, level DB database is actually, you know, thousands and thousands of small individual little files that it manages there, right? So one of the early like problems that users had with InfluxDB was they would hit file limit, file open file handle limits, right? Literally, we had to keep telling people like, oh, you need to adjust these up, which is, I guess, more standard now, but like I can't tell you how many like bug re bug reports we got because people didn't have their file handle limits high enough, right? So essentially, we created a level DB database for each one of these things, and then you know we would drop the entire the entire database when that felt, when it aged out, and it wasn't we felt like it wasn't an ideal structure, and that and like the Seago bridge wasn't ideal either, and there are other things like. Doing backups was really, really hard at that time. Like, I, I don't know that we ever even had backups technically for version 0 0.8, which still used level DB. So essentially, we wanted to solve some of those problems. So when we created the next version 0 0.9, we thought, oh, we'll use Bolt DB, which is also a key value store. It's written in Go. But it's a different structure. So level DB is what's called a log structured merge tree, which is actually 
something that's fairly good for for this kind of use case. Bolt DB is what's called a copy on write B plus tree, which is fantastic if you have a high read workload. It's kind of ruinous if you have a super high insert workload, which we do. We didn't realize this early on, so we built around it. And actually, the 0.9 series of releases was essentially two things that we were getting done at that time. One, we were changing the data model to the data model you see today in InfluxDB, which is you have a measurement, you have tags, which are key value pairs where the values are strings, and then you have fields where you know the key is the field key is the name of the thing and then the value is whatever kind of value you're measuring which could be a float an int a boolean or a string so with version 0.9 what we did is we introduced this data model and we basically split the database out into two separate things one which is an inverted index that maps metadata to an underlying time series and the other is time series data which in 0.9, we were trying to keep in Bolt DB. We worked on that for probably about eight months until we realized that Bolt DB just wasn't going to work for what we were trying to do. So in over what early September, over like a holiday weekend, I kind of like prototyped out this idea for for what I was thinking of as the time structured merge tree, which is the storage engine we ended up building. Right. And it's basically a storage engine that we designed that's kind of like a log structure merge tree, but optimized for this time series use case, right? How we saw data flowing in and and all this other stuff. So this was in this was in 2015 that we were doing all of this work, right? September of 2015. I prototyped this out. We real and it t- it takes a few months and we realize, okay, this is probably actually gonna be really good. So by March of 2016. We had a release of InfluxDB, which I think was the 0.11 release, where we had the first like version of that storage engine paired with this new data model and with the same old query language that we had. And we saw at that stage performance that was really, really exceptional. Right? We had much better performance than we ever had with previous versions of InfluxDB. And the, the data model kind of mapped with how people were thinking about their data. So... In version 0.8, we had a data model where you had like a table or a measurement name, whatever you want to call it, and then a bunch of columns. And it was really easy in 0.8 for people to create a schema that gave them very, very poor performance. And again, how this would come through is like people would log bugs and they'd be like, oh, the performance sucks after I, you know, insert 10 million rows into the database. We're like, well, that's because your schema doesn't match like how you're trying to query your data. So... When we introduced the tags concept, the goal there was to create a like kind of like drive users into modeling their data in such a way that they would get like good query performance out of the box. So we released version 1.0 in September 2016 with that with that, you know, that custom storage engine that we had built. And that was looking good. But even with that release, as I mentioned, it's two data stores. It's an inverted index for the metadata and then the time series data store. In that version, the time series data was kept on disk and the inverted index was built only in memory. So basically, when the database server booted up, it would build the inverted index on the fly from the underlying time series data. And what that meant was, as the database got bigger and bigger, you got more and more time series data, the boot up process would take longer and longer. So for the next... I'd say probably for the rest of 2016 and the first half of 2017, we put a ton of work into adding basically the time series index, which is essentially an inverted index on disk that we could use. And when the combination of those two, TSM and TSI, formed the the core storage engine that actually underlies 1.0 and also in FlexDB 2.0, it's the same storage engine. In both. And uh, yeah. So while you explained all this, I wondered how much of it was informed by your choice of programming language and how much was just very general, you know, algorithms work or architecture work. And and maybe you can shed some light on this. Would you say that Go impacted the design or would you say that was completely agnostic of, of Go or 
especially with regards to like garbage collector times or high cardinality? Uh, I think I, the only way I think Go impacted the design, it didn't impact the architectural design. Like most of the work we're doing here, like would have been the same stuff we would have had to do regardless of the language, right? If we had written it C, C++ or then later Rust, like there's still like these core things that you have to figure out. I will say that the choice of Go as a language definitely impacted what we decided to use as dependencies, right? If we had written the entire thing in C++, we almost certainly would have just taken an existing storage engine from somewhere else and used it, right? Because that's way, way easier. And another part of this is essentially like a learning process as we went, right? Well, knowing what I know now, I would not build a storage engine. Like that's not something I would spend my time doing. You can basically pick something else up and get a lot more mileage just by using you know stuff that people already have. But at the same time, like that was you know ten anywhere from eight to ten years ago, and you, there were a lot fewer options in terms of the different you know technologies you could use. Right, most storage engines in 2013, 2014, 2015, were again designed for transactional workloads. And the time series use case is, in in my mind, it's not a transactional workload. Like it's insert heavy with very large range scans and, you know, very large data evictions. And that kind of like makes it very different than, than other database workloads. So, you know, I don't know that Go as a language really impacted all that stuff but again like it's it's hard to say <laughs> was it still at a time where you had some parts of your code written in c++ or would you say that was already beyond c++ for InfluxDB? no so the only thing we ever had in c++ was well the first the first versions of of InfluxDB used LevelDB as the storage engine, which is in C plus plus, and we had like a Yak parser for the for the query language, which was originally in C, but then with zero point nine and and then the releases after that, we built a you know parser for the query language in Go, so it was a pure Go parser, and zero point nine and the releases after were the one had no C plus plus code whatsoever. Right, they're all just pure Go code bases. Mm -hmm. That was around the time of Rust 1.0. I wonder when was the first time you heard about Rust? I certainly knew about Rust pretty early on. I definitely knew about it in by like 2015. By 1.0, I I definitely knew about Rust, but. I had had hesitation to pick up the language because I, so I had actually in 2010 and half of 2011, I spent my time writing actually, well, yeah, I spent my time writing Scala code. So I picked up Scala and I became a big Scala enthusiast for like a year or so. And then after working with it for a year, I realized that I actually didn't like the language. <laughs> I didn't, I did personally didn't like it because I thought it was like too complex there were too many things in Scala. It was basically trying to be all things to all people was my feeling about it. If you're a Scala fan, I, I apologize. <laughs> it's just my, my, my personal, I didn't feel like great love for the language after I'd worked with it for over a year and a half. And my early impressions of Rust were that it was a very complex language with a very large like footprint in terms of like syntax and all this other stuff. And I had heard it was like difficult to learn. And to me, those were all markers of a language that wouldn't get any adoption, right? Like I, I loved Go because you could learn the language in like a day at the time in 2013. Like, you know, you could read through the guide and like any, it, like anybody, I, anybody who had worked with a few programming languages before could pick up Go pretty easily, right? And I thought that was a great strength of Go as a language. I still do in addition to, you know, great compile times, which I very much miss. Uh, <laughs> um, but so, so basically like Rust, I didn't, I kind of ignored it for the first, like basically until probably about 2018. I like, I knew about it and I just like, was like, I'm not gonna, I had one, like I'm obviously like I was completely fully invested in Go. Everything we did was in Go. 
at least on the back end, you know, on the front end, obviously there's, you know, TypeScript and JavaScript and all that stuff. So I didn't bother. And then in 2018, I basically thought, well, maybe there's something here. Honestly, the thing that attracted me to Rust initially was like just seeing reports of people just building highly performant systems, right? I was like, that's, that's what lured me in to begin with. And I was just like, you know what? I haven't given this language a fair chance. I've been kind of judgmental based on no actual knowledge. So I'm going to like commit to actually really trying to learn it. So I, 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 I wanted to work through this book about programming interpreters. It's uh, Torsten Ball, I think his name. And he, re- he read it, wrote it for with Go as the language that he used. And it's basically programming like, you know, a, creating a whole programming language from scratch, right? Right. A lexer, a parser, an interpreter, and then a VM and all this other stuff. It's like, I'll work my way through this book, but instead of doing the examples in Go, I'll do the examples in Rust. And I, you know, I read my way through the the free online book, Programming Rust or whatever. I can't remember the exact title of it. And it did, it still wasn't clicking. You know, I basically started the, started it and got a certain way. And then, you know, I kept getting tripped up by, by the borrow checker and stuff like that. And I was like, okay, obviously I still don't get it enough to, to do anything useful. So then I got the, the O'Reilly book on programming Rust. And this, this again, like 2018. And once I worked through a good chunk of that book, I started actually being able to, you know, create something. So I probably wrote, you know, I did this project. I probably wrote maybe like 2,500 lines of Rust. None of it I didn't use any crates. I didn't use, I, there was no multi-threaded piece. There was no network programming piece, right? So it was very like kind of constrained problem space, but it was enough for me to learn some of the key parts of the language. And at that point, I just became super excited about Rust. I was like, yeah, it's really hard to learn, but it actually like there are some things here that I think are super compelling as far as a language goes. And then... But the thing is, I didn't have any reason to use it. So, you know, I wrote a blog post about my experience and said I was excited about it. And that was that. And then in, I think it was in the fall of 2019, the async await stuff finally landed, right? And obviously that stuff had been in the works for a while, but it landed in a way that you could actually like use it for real. At least I I thought like people who were in Rust like probably had already been doing it for a while, but it fall of 2019 is when I remember like saying like, oh, now that that's landed, Rust is going to become basically like maybe the language of first choice for building high performance server side software, right? System software of all kinds. And we had some big things we had to do with InfluxDB. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe I should try writing, you know, this next, at least this core of the database piece in, in Rust, which I can talk about as well (laughs) i would describe this learning process as hardcore mode it feels like you are a very analytical person and a very thorough person in your thinking and learning process maybe that's just one observation but i wonder how much of this is because of your background and maybe your way of thinking in systems or has it always been like this, the learning process for new technologies? No, I don't, I don't think so. I don't know. I'd like, I think I took a little bit more of a deliberate approach with Rust than I have with other things. Although I don't know if that's true either. Cause then again, like with Go, like I, you know, I, when I picked up Go, I had a very specific project I was trying to do, which was build this like back end you know, database, back, back end, the back end for airplane, right? Which essentially is what became InfluxDB. So I had this very specific project. I was like, I, I know I'm going to use Go. I knew about LevelDB, so I need to figure out how to pull that in. And I used that little project as a way to like initially learn the language. And again, like I worked through all the reading materials online, like a book and stuff like that. Generally, if I'm going to learn a language, like I like to have a book, I, I don't need a physical book, but I like to have like a book to like read through as well as like online documentation and stuff like that. But I prefer like the structure of a book. But even then, like 
I guess the last language I well, Scala I'd learned, but again, that was around a specific project that I was doing. In 2005, I was, you know, a a C sharp .NET programmer and I was no longer doing that. And I quit work to go back to school. And I was like, okay, I can literally pick up any new language I want. So I went shopping around for languages. I was like, okay, there are two contenders here in 2005. One was Python and one was Ruby. And I basically learned the basics of both of them. And I ended up picking Ruby specifically because of Ruby on Rails. I ended up being a Ruby programmer. But again, I think the learning process with both of those was again, like pick up a book, read through it, try and have, I mean, generally like if I'm trying to learn a new thing, a new programming language or something like that, like the best way for me to learn it is to actually put it to use in something. So I pick some sort of project. It doesn't have to be a project that is like ever going to be used in any meaningful way, but it's something, right? So again, like when I learned Rust, it was I'll I'll implement this, you know, this language the that that he that Torsen created in it for his book. I'll implement that in Rust. And of course, like all that code, like co- the code's online, it lives, but it's you know, nobody's using it. It's it's something I created just to like go into the trash. And the other thing I observed, which is also really cool, is that I saw a bit of a pattern. When when you discovered Go, you went ahead and built the core of what would become the new engine for InfluxDB in Go. And you kind of did the same in Rust, right? You locked yourself in for a while, you built this thing, and then you had a project and you you got more you gained more confidence by doing that yeah for sure i mean the so talking about the you know the rust implementation of influxdb in in late 2019 essentially like we were still very we we had all of our effort going into version 2.0 both the open source and our commercial products and with 2.0 we had tried to create you know, branch out beyond just the database, we tried to create this whole like platform for working with time series data, right? So it's like the database, all these other pieces, tasks. And we also at the same time, you know, created a new programming language, a scripting language called Flux for this, because, you know, we wanted people to basically be able to inject code into the platform and execute like arbitrary logic inside of it in addition to just like declarative style queries against time series data and the other thing we did was we we decided to go to shift our company to be a cloud first company previously with version one and beyond all the version one releases of InfluxDB, we had a cloud hosted platform which is single tenant and we had a on-premise commercial product right and what we did was we shipped that commercial product as like, it's like an enterprise software release cycle, right? We'd ship that like two to four times a year, but really only like two feature bearing releases a year. And then that would get rolled out to the single tenant cloud platform. With 2.0, what I told the engineering team is like, I want engineers to be able to ship code to production every business day, which is very, very different than, you know, six month release cadence on, you know, a shipped package software product, right? So we shifted to that. And, you know, as part of that created this like multi-tenant platform with all this other stuff. So in late 2019, we were doing all this stuff and none of it was essentially the core of the database. The core of the database was still exactly the same as what it was for version one. And, you know, we're, we're doing all this work and we can see I mean, customers are basically asking us for a set of features that we can't deliver on because everybody else is focused on all these other things, right? The features they're asking for is infinite cardinality, right? Cardinality is essentially like, I mentioned you have tag key value pairs. Those are kind of like the dimensions that describe the data. Like a tag key value pair could be like what region or a server name or a process ID or like whatever. So they want as the as the number of unique values for the tag values goes up, that creates higher and higher cardinality in the implementation of InfluxDB at that time and many other time series databases. High cardinality is a a very big problem, right? The performance falls over; it just creates all sorts of problems. 
So people wanted to be able to not worry about cardinality. They also wanted tiered data storage, right? They wanted to be able to keep their historical data in cheap object storage as opposed to on locally attached SSDs with provisioned IOPS and all this other stuff. And a lot of people wanted, you know, so, well, they wanted these like core database features. They want better query performance as well. A lot of people had been asking us for years if we were going to support SQL, right? Our language before 2.0 is InfluxQL, which looks kind of like SQL, but it isn't. And for somebody who's really, really familiar with SQL, the ways in which it's not SQL can be quite frustrating. Like it's really powerful and useful for creating a basic time series query. Like you can express a basic time series query in InfluxQL faster and easier, I think, than you can in SQL. But when you want to do more advanced analytical things, InfluxQL doesn't have the capabilities and we couldn't figure out how to like bring that into the language, right? And people kept asking us for all these features. So, you know, in late 2019, early 2020, I realized I was like, okay, everybody's still focused on the 2.0 stuff and they need to do that. But I need to like start thinking about the new, like the, how we're actually going to get the core of the database to deliver these things, infinite cardinality, tiered data storage, and better, better query performance. I thought, well, that's basically totally a totally different database than the database we have, right? Like the entire database architecture we had is around this like inverted index and time series data store. I was like, well, maybe, you know, I'll start prototyping some ideas and I'll do it in Rust. So it was me and another engineer at, in the beginning just for the for a couple of months. And, you know, we start pro- prototyping some ideas. Another engineer joins us, you know, about three months in to this effort, right? And at this stage, you know, it's three of us and the engineering team at Influx at that point is probably like 80 people. So, right, three people is just not like, we're, we're not making a huge commitment here. We're really just kind of like playing around in the lab, trying to see like if there's something interesting here. And along the way, I saw some some other things. Now, at this stage, like the goal is to solve those problems, but I I had some guesses about some tools that we'd want to use. So one was like, I wanted to use as much existing open source software as we could. So initially my intention was that we'd actually take the query engine and potentially storage engine from an existing open source project it written in likely C++ or C. So I was like, we're going to have a huge dependency on a, on a big mountain of C++ code. If we want a SQL engine, we're probably going to want to pull in an existing engine, right? Which again, is going to be in C or C++. So I was pretty sure we were going to have that. And I also knew that, you know, I wanted the other guarantees that Rust provides. So one, you can pull in C++ code and you don't have to pay a performance penalty, right? It's not like the C Go bridge. And two, like I wanted, you know, all the the good Rust stuff, you know, like the error handling, crates, concurrency, no garbage collector, right? The borrow checker, all of that stuff. And over the course of 2020, we did more and more research. And actually we ended up deciding not to use a big mountain of C and C++ code. We picked up an existing project called Data Fusion, which is under the Apache Foundation. It's actually a sub-project of Apache Arrow, and it's written in pure Rust, and it's essentially a SQL parser, planner, optimizer, and execution engine. So, yeah. Early on when we talked about Rust, you mentioned async Rust, and that felt like a pivotal moment for you when you realized, oh yeah, seems like the ecosystem, the community is moving towards async Rust. And when you described the features that you wanted to build with Rust for InfluxDB, you didn't mention async Rust. So I wonder, was it still on your radar or would you have changed something in the design of the new InfluxDB rewrite in Rust if async didn't become a thing? Or was it something extra on top, like a little cherry on top? I mean, it definitely would have changed the the way the code looks and all that other stuff. But as I mentioned, like using object store as the historical data store was one part. So like we need to be able to make many requests at the same time to object storage 
and be able to pull back that data as it comes in, right? Both sending data to it and reading data from it. But ultimately, like, you know, InfluxDB3 is a distributed system. So, you know, we need a way to talk to a bunch of different servers at the same time to make the whole thing work. So when I, you know, saw async rust, I thought, okay, async rust is the thing that's going to make it so that people can build, you know, server software that has to communicate over the network to a, a lot of other systems more efficiently. At least that was my, my thought. I don't know if that is true, but whatever. That was, that's what I was thinking. So, you know, obviously we, you know, we use the Tokyo runtime inside the server and, you know, we async is littered everywhere in, in our Rust code base. So it definitely like without async Rust, we would have changed what we had to build. I'm thinking we probably would have had to write more code to deal with all the network programming and all that other stuff. Whereas like using async Rust, we're able to pull in, you know, a variety of other crates and existing libraries to do those things. Mm Mm-hmm. But some of the things we've created, right? So like the object store create crate that we use is is one we created. And then after we basically wanted, we knew we had had to work in, you know, all the major cloud platforms with their versions of object store. So Azure, GCP, AWS. So we created this crate that kind of like has one API and behind that underlying implementations for those things. And we actually ended up donating that create to the Apache Foundation. So that's now part of I think it's a subproject in Arrow maybe or I don't I don't know where it is, but it's it lives on its own separately. So correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like InfluxDB is fundamentally an IO bound system. So you have a lot of IO that you need to do either from the disk or over the network. And this is where async Rust shines. Or would you also say, actually, it's also a CPU-bound problem because we need to do quite a lot of computation to even know what query we are going to execute and where we are going to fetch the data and how we are going to ag- aggregate it before we send it back to the client? Yeah, so it's it's kind of both, <laughs> unfortunately. I mean, so the way the way it's organized is like data is organized into a logical database and then below that a table and then below that a partition and beneath the partition you have individual parquet files we use parquet as the persistence format for for 3.0 now the model of it is essentially when a query comes in it evaluates the query to find what partitions and what individual parquet files it needs to execute against for the query but once it finds those it just does a brute force query computation on that, right? And it's, you know, it's a like a best-in-class columnar database, right? So when you think about columnar databases, generally their performance you expect is about, you know, you can get through about a billion records per core per second, right? So basically, but that's if you're churning through a lot of CPU. And if you want, like, to get through more, you have to figure out a way to spread it out over mul- multiple cores, so it can become, I mean, depending on the query that's being executed, it can become quite CPU intensive. But I will say, you know, we're running 3.0 in production now, right? And the, the design of it, it's not, it's not like a monolithic database, right? We've actually taken it and separated it out into different components. So there's like an ingestion tier, there's a compaction piece, and then there's the query tier. So when a query comes in, it has to ask the ingestion tier for a buffer of data, and then it has to either work with Parquet data that's already in cache, or it has to go to object storage to get it. So if we look at you know traces for individual query response times, most of the time the query response time is dominated by network calls, and not by not by actual computation. But again, I think that's kind of an artifact of how people are using the database right now today for the kinds of queries they're executing. I think as as we pick up workloads, there are more real-time analytics workloads, not just like metric data workloads that are querying, you know, the last five minutes of data or the last hour of data. People are going to get into larger, you know, more computationally intensive queries. And eventually maybe, you know, more 
some more like data warehouse and OLAP workloads as well. Mm-hmm. Um, at which point I think there'll be a lot of compute stuff. The way I see it, you have this amazing little piece of technology now. You have your prototype. It seems to work as expected. You see the benefits. But at the same time, you said that you already have quite a big engineering team. Of course, granted, they work on different projects, so you don't have to bring everyone in at the same time. But I can imagine that it might take some convincing at least to do this buy-in, even though it's maybe not a risky one. But at least you want to mention the trade-offs to the team and maybe get their acceptance, get their buy-in before you start deploying Rust across InfluxDB and maybe also Influx Data. Yeah, and so this was a, a multi-year development effort, right? So for 2020, essentially, it was a research project, you know, with me and one other person initially, and then a third person, and it was basically us creating it. And I had definitely had to convince the you know the first guy to to work on it. I had to convince him that Rust was a good idea, and he was willing to give it a shot. And the other guy coming in, he was actually a new hire. But his experience was in C++. Recently, he had been doing a bunch of Python stuff, but his database experience was in C++, and he had had no Rust experience coming in. So he had to learn Rust once he got hired. And initially, you know, he wasn't sure, but after after a year, he was definitely all in. He's like, yes, like Rust is obviously the best choice for this kind of a project. So now he's a, he's a very large fan of the language. But I... I announced that we were working on this like new core of the database in November of 2020 in a in a talk I did. And I said we were hiring and basically like we got a bunch of inbound interest because of the fact that it was written in Rust. So at that point, we got some people who already knew the language, definitely people who knew the language better than me, which I guess isn't a super high bar. But <laughs> so we ended up hiring you know, we ended up building out the team to nine people by essentially the beginning of March of 2021. So those nine people worked on the the database. At that point, we'd selected all the tools we were going to use. And we're like, at, at that stage, it was like creating a bunch of code and iterating on the architectural design of the database. And they worked on that for, you know, all of 2021. And basically up until probably August of 2022, at which point we started trying to loop in a lot more of the engineering team, right? By then we saw that, you know, we needed, we really desperately needed to get this new like core of the database released to solve all these problems that our customers were asking us to solve. And we needed to loop in more of the engineers to be able to get it, you know, deployed meaningful, meaningfully into production. But at this stage, we still have, you know, a split in our engineering organization of, you know, the people who are the Rust programmers And the people who are the Go programmers, and generally they're not there. There, there's some people on the engineering team who like flip flop between the two, but for the most part, it's like you're either in one camp or the other. And we, I mean, we're going to continue to run Go code in production for for years. So that's not that's not like going away. So I imagine you know, if I were to talk to you three years from now, we're still going to be running some Go code in production. We're still going to have some Go programmers on staff, but probably more Rust programmers than Go programmers at that stage. Mm-hmm. That means initially you hired people that already knew Rust, but then later on you needed to train people on the job. The existing team that previously did most of the Go work also had to learn Rust, or at least the people that wanted to. I wonder how that went. Did you just test the uh, experienced people to train the non-experienced people or did you get any outside help? Did you use any workshops, any training material? How was the process? Yeah, so so initially, you know, the three people working on the project knew nothing about Rust. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, we were learning it as we went. And then, you know, once we hired people in, I'd say like, Three of the new hires that we made knew Rust well, and everybody else like had to learn it. So we we ended up bringing in Integer Thirty Two, which is a consulting company, Jake and Carol, to to help us out. One with like 
code. And so, you know, writing code and doing code reviews and like helping us out there. But we've also had them, they run like a multi-day class training session. And we've run, had them run people through that a few times, like different groups of engineers within our company through that. So that I think that's really, really helpful. Like what the experience I didn't have for the first like six months I was personally writing Rust was I had nobody I could ask really basic, dumb questions to, which I think would have helped my learning process a lot more. <laughs> like, if, you know, if like ChatGPT existed back then, I would have asked it all sorts of dumb Rust questions that probably would have like shortened my learning time just like immensely. <laughs> That's great that they came in and helped you out with that and probably focused on the more intricate parts and just generally taking questions from the team. And I think this is how you should do it. But at the same time, I wonder, did you have confidence in the code base? Did you think that the code was idiomatic from the beginning? Did you do any pair programming or reviews, code reviews to ensure that the code was idiomatic, that you could extend it and it was kind of rustic, quote unquote? Yeah, so we didn't do pair programming, but we did. We always do code reviews, right? So pull requests with code reviews to change stuff. And we brought we brought Carol and Jake in pretty early to do that, specifically because I I knew that we didn't have the expertise in house, and I was like, I want to make sure that what we're creating isn't a complete mess. I think I so I, yeah, I would worry about whether or not something was idiomatic and it was like rustic, but at the same time, like I wouldn't worry about whether or not the code was correct, right? Like I feel like the compiler gives you a lot of confidence in terms of being able to write code that, you know, is going to be relatively performant, relatively correct. Of course, like mileage may vary, but yeah. Since you already touched on it, let's speak about performance. Do you see any big performance improvements with regards to Rust in comparison to Go? And and if so, where? Yeah, so I can't really I can't really speak to that because we didn't we didn't take something in Go and create the exact same thing in Rust. Right? We totally changed the database architecture. Nothing like it is the same. I guess one thing we created, which I don't know if we've actually performance benchmarked this, is you know, InfluxDB has has a line protocol, which is like a text protocol for specified for writing in data. And we did create like a Rust parser for this line protocol data. So we could probably do a benchmark of that versus the Go line protocol parser. I'm not sure which would come out ahead, to be totally honest, because the Go line protocol parser has been heavily, heavily optimized. And that's one of those things where, yeah, I, I, I don't know. But the yeah, the performance of you know version three of the database, like we've seen really, really great you know performance wins on, you know, we can ingest far more data using fewer CPUs. We get a compression win because we changed the file format to Parquet. We get better compression than we did before. And, you know, depending on the query, like the thing that dominates query times in these use cases, again, like I said, it's generally not the actual compute. It's how you, what you filter the query down to, right? So in InfluxDB 1 and 2, if you had a query that touched, you know, a million time series, that either wouldn't run or it'd just run incredibly slowly. In version three, because of the way we organize the data, you can execute a query that touches a million time series and, you know, execute in milliseconds. It's fine. But at the same time, there are queries in version three that are slower. So a query that asks for one specific time series, version one and two of InfluxDB is optimized for that kind of use case. So that query is exceptionally fast because what it does is it checks the inverted index, it finds the time series ID, and then the the way the data is laid out on disk is actually sorted by that time series and time. So they can basically jump right to the file, right to where the data is, and read it out. So it's super, super fast. In three, it identifies these large chunks of data, and then it has to brute force an execution path to pull out the specific individual time series from it. That's generally fast enough, but we're definitely seeing cases where we need to add like 
further either customization or optimizations so that people can kind of like design a schema for that specific use case. But again, like none of this is really a Rust versus Go comparison because we didn't we didn't rewrite the same thing. We created a totally different thing. It just happens to share the same name, but as a database, it looks completely different under the under the hood. That means you chose Rust not solely because of performance improvements or because of the potential for performance improvements. There might be things that go beyond that, which brought you to Rust. Maybe you can talk about this. I don't want to put words or into your mouth or make any assumptions. So I want to hear it from you. What, what is the main benefit other than performance? Yeah, so I, I mentioned this before. I think like the, the fearless concurrency, right? Having, you know, eliminating data races, essentially, which we, ha we had before, like these really gnarly bugs in version one of Influx due to stuff like that, which we just wouldn't, wouldn't have in, in Rust. I think... Crates is like a, a great system for sharing libraries and sharing dependencies. It's been a long time since I've actually been a Go programmer. My Go experience predates modern Go package management. But I'll say from like 2013, 2012 to 2016, when I was writing Go code, the package management situation was a nightmare. It was terrible. Um, <laughs> again, my personal opinion, maybe not everybody agrees. But I, I viewed crates as like a really a great strength of Rust as a language, having that there. What else? The error handling, the way error handling works in Rust. Again, like coming from Go, like checking for nil and like, you know, we got bit by that so many times too. And again, that's just something you just don't have to worry about it in Rust, right? You check error types and whatever. So yeah, the error handling is something that was appealing to me. What else? Did yeah, you I mean, have any problems like with? Sorry, did did you have any problems with deadlocks in the old Go version? I know that Rust doesn't protect you from deadlocks necessarily, but I I wonder if if you see a difference here, or if that never was a problem with Go. I mean, deadlocks are always a problem. I don't care what language you're in, I guess. So. I don't think they're any more or less of a problem in Rust than they have been in Go. Yeah. Nice. So overall, I would say it was a great transition, a happy customer experience, a good case for it. And I wonder how you could use that language now, now that you have this tool in your hands to build something that goes beyond what you have right now even. So what would InfluxDB look like in 2024, 2025, moving in? And what sort of features are you planning to build? Yeah, so the, I mean, the, right now, the, the version three of the database is actually just the core of the database. We still have the, the same, we brought over the version one API. So you can write data to it as though it's a version one database. You can query data from it as though it's a version one database, right? You can. So the same API, same query language, influx QL, and we have the version two write interface. The only new like query interface we have now is Flight SQL, right? Is a SQL based query interface using Apache RO Flight. But now, like with Parquet as the storage format, Parquet has support for like structured nested data. I, basically, I can see us creating a new version three write API that supports a much richer data model than we do now. It's being able to specify like the units of something that's measured or specify rates, an actual histogram type that is built in, right? An underlying histogram type and nested types like structs, enums, arrays, those kinds of things. Like, so I see us adding those kinds of features on the right side and then on the query side, enabling people to pull that stuff out. And then one of the other things I really want to add in is essentially an embedded VM, right? And at this stage, I'm thinking either Python or JavaScript. I'm not sure which, but I really like to have an embedded VM in the, in the actual database so that you can do, essentially, there are three different cases, right? So one is essentially something kind of like a database trigger 
where when you write data in, it would execute a script that you specify to transform the write or do something when you when you have a write come in. Another is on persist. So basically, data gets buffered up in the database and that gets persisted as a parquet file. So I'd like to open like an event there so that people could attach like a script in the database. So they could transform the data. They could do things with it either before it gets written out to, to modify it or basically as a, as a result of it getting written out, like you can build like monitoring alerting. And then the other is essentially like a periodic, a periodic system, like, you know, like, like cron essentially in the database, but being able to specify that so that you can both like, ideally you're at that point, you're putting a script inside the database and you can query data out of the database and have like a very, you know, fast performing experience because you have this data locality. So features around that, I think, and then enabling having essentially like a shared service where people can share like scripts and stuff like that, that, that are useful within the database. So those are things I can see us doing. And then obviously like we are, we're big contributors to Apache Arrow Rust, the Rust Arrow RS, as well as Data Fusion. And I see us just contributing, continuing to contribute to that. I really think like some of those building blocks, those Rust building blocks are going to be, are going to form the basis of a lot of like really interesting, you know, large scale data processing systems over the next, you know, five to 10 years, right? Things that take place of, you know, a lot of stuff that's currently in Java, right? So, for doing large scale data analytics, analytical processing, stream processing. And I really see, I mean, I think that's what's going to be interesting to watch over the next like 10 years is what new Rust projects are formed to start taking, you know, market share away from some of these larger, older Java native projects. When you said you want a query language, the one thing that came to mind was WebAssembly. I wonder if you could support both languages, both Python and JavaScript with something like WebAssembly. Have you considered that? Yeah, my concern is that it's just not going to be performant enough because you need to copy the data into the WebAssembly VM and like all this other stuff and then copy it out. I'm just worried that that bridge is going to be too expensive. So it's an idea. I don't know. I'm not going to create the VM. Whatever it is, it's going to be something that's already written. We're not going to create the VM. We're not going to create the language. We want to just like use existing tooling that's out there and and let people adopt, you know, a la- use a language that they're already familiar with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very exciting because it feels like you move away from pure time series data towards an analytical engine, if you like, or at least some sort of marketplace so that people can share scripts or share ideas or think about different ways how to use the data and make it work for their business and their use case. And I don't know any other players that are are in that realm. And also if there's any collaboration between those different companies or if you would say, no, inherently this is such a special problem. You're working with very specific data here. It doesn't make any sense to even share scripts across databases or across these engines? No, I mean, I think, I mean, it, so to me, I, the way I think of time series is not just like metric data. Really, like the vision for InfluxDB has kind of always been that it would be like the place for observational data of all kinds, whether it's metric data, event data, you know, logs and traces I view as time series data too, just like different kinds of structures so I think there, are, and, and, and then sensor data, again, like depending on the sensor, there are all different kinds of sensors. So people's specific data problems are probably unique to them, but the kinds of things you want to do against these, there are patterns that pop up, right? So a common pattern in like monitoring alerting is like what's called a dead man alert, right? Like if you have a sensor where you expect a reading every minute and it stops reporting, that triggers an alert condition, Right. So there, I think there are like little bits of code, ideally, that people would be able to share across these different things, these, you know, places where they identify, oh, this is a common transformation that you need to make on time series data to do this kind of analysis or whatever. I think 
most of the the data and analytics companies, I mean, real time analytics companies and all these other things, they're if they're collaborating at all, it's around some underlying libraries, right? So Data Fusion, for example, is used, you know, and developed not just by us, but by a bunch of other companies, some of which we may end up competing with, you know, at some point in the future. And and so there's like the actual underlying libraries and then there are kind of like the standards. So within analytics, I think one of the standards that's starting to get traction is something called Apache Iceberg. And it's basically a spec for a catalog, a catalog of, of data in object storage. So tab, tabular data and object storage. It was originally created at Netflix and then open sourced and put in the Apache Foundation. And it looks like, you know, some of the analytic companies are starting to pick up support for it. And we're certainly going to support it as well. Right. So Snowflake, Databricks, a bunch of mothers. Yeah. As you can imagine, there might be a few people who listen to this podcast who might get excited to either try Rust or InfluxDB or a combination of those. And I wonder if you want to give them any hints on how they can get started, how they can start contributing, the sorts of things that you would like to have help with or even just feedback from the community. Yeah, so so for InfluxDB, like right now, the only way to experience InfluxDB 3 is through our our commercial products, right? Our multi-tenant platform or our dedicated single-tenant platform or our on-premise software. Like I said, we don't have we don't have an open source release yet. So for us, like the the best contributions we see are in the data fusion projects, right? Although that can be kind of a hard project to get into because it's, you know, a query planner and optimizer and execution engine. So sometimes that can be kind of an opaque project to pick up and learn about i think you know for people getting started with rust the best thing to do is you know read through read through a book pick a project that you want to actually implement with it and and go with that and then you know if there are open source projects that you know of in rust that you know are interesting you know it's always it's always a useful to look through other people's code and read other people's code to see how they structure things so, yeah. And finally, is there anything that you would like to mention, something that you would like to promote or maybe something that you want to share with the Rust community? This is your moment. We're hiring Rust programmers. <laughs> so, yeah. No, and hopefully, like like I said, soon, you know, end of this year, early next year, we'll have an actual open source release of InfluxDB3 that was written in Rust. And I think that'll be a very, very exciting time. So if you want to contribute to it and get paid for it, please reach out. I'm Paul at InfluxData.com. Amazing. Yes. I love that you're uh, so approachable and uh, I love that you're such a nice conversation partner. It was a really great interview. Thanks a lot for taking the time, Paul. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me on.